There we go. Hi, everybody. This is Eric Inga. Uh, the, uh, the the little hangout thing here fooled me. I thought it was live, and it wasn't quite there yet. But anyway, this is the Digital Marketing Excellence Show, uh, and so that must mean it's Thursday. But in any case, uh, really pleased to have uh, Mike Blumenthal here with me. Uh, say hi and give yourself a brief uh, intro, Mike. Oh, a brief intro. Gosh. Uh, I, I didn't tell you I was going to do that. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, local search consultant. Been involved in local search for the last eight years. My blog, uh, Understanding Google Local and Local Search. I uh, founded a speaker series about, uh, and training with David Mim called Local U. And I also run an online uh, review reputation management product with Don Campbell called Get Five Stars. My friends refer to me as Professor Maps. And when I once asked them why, was it because I was so erudite and professorial? Or was it because I was so pedantic? And they said yes. Yeah, there you go. Well, there you go. Covered on both points. So. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah, well, I mean, Mike is known as one of the uh, the, the top experts on local search in general, and uh, that's why I was uh, really pleased to be able to get him on the on the show today. We're, we're going to dive into uh, what's going on uh, and what's happened with Google's uh, Pigeon update, uh, so, so named by uh, search engine land, uh, Danny Sullivan, I guess, uh, thought that we needed another uh, black and white uh, type creature, although it's kind of a gray-blue uh, color uh, um, in many pigeons I've seen. But um, but before we do that, I think we want to spend a little time and lay some groundwork, right, Mike? And um, just to give a brief overview of, uh, uh, of how uh, it's just the local search ecosystem and basically how it works and how it's different from... Uh, uh, you know, basic web search, if you will, if there is such a thing today. Um, and then we'll uh, get into pigeon-specific things. I do want to remind our viewers that we always love to get questions, so we will take them during the show today as well. But Mike, if you could just start by talking a little bit about the, the uh, you know, the way local search works and how it's different in general, that'd be great. So, I mean, local search has gone through a huge evolution in the last two years. Originally, Google uh, would rebuild the world every six weeks. They would take all their search results. They would take all the inputs from the local ecosystem and literally recreate business entities every six weeks as a sort of static web result. And then they would index those and then bring them into the main search results as pack results. Um, about two, you know, they bought MetaBase, and then uh, at the beginning of 2012, they converted local search to a from a dynamic. Uh, sort of indexed, re-indexed, recreated every six weeks to a static record, and then over the last two years have painfully transitioned all of the pipelines into that data set and all of the interfaces. That was the humongous transition from places to plus that is mostly done now. Um, and in doing so, you know, pulled off one of the amazing technical feats of our, my recent memory in terms of, you know, it's sort of like driving the bus down the road changing out the engine, giving it a new paint job, uh, putting in new seats while keeping the passengers at least, they didn't lose too many uh, out of the bus. I mean, a huge shift of architecture, inputs, outputs, everything, all the while delivering local results as pack results from the local index. Obviously, local is viewed by Google as a syndicated service, right? They, they have a canonical record in this uh, knowledge base that they deliver up wherever it's needed. Plus, Maps, Google Now, Glass, or the most you know, visible is the pack results that show up on the front page. Um, you know, they assemble these results algorithmically. They take feeds from the primary data suppliers, locally is InfoUSA, uh, Axiom. They take you know, enhanced data, perhaps categories from super pages, yp.com. They take the data you give them and they create a canonical record in their database, which they then use to fulfill local search queries, which are either geo-modified or not. And now that we're moving to such increased contextual information of mobile phones, many of the search queries are, not, are modified, but 
with words like near me or nearby instead of with geo modifiers like on the desktop. And as they've done that, they've sort of reduced the radius that they've delivered results from. So if you're doing a typical urban local search, you might get results that are within two miles of you. Whereas on the desktop, the results might be, you know, a search on Google's Google.com might be 7, 8, or 9, or 10, or 12 miles, depending on what they need to do to fill the data set. In mobile, the search query could be as small as 2 miles, or smaller, depending on the density of the businesses that they're showing you. So that's local in a nutshell. How did I do? Good, good. So with the, uh, uh, with the, you know, with the phone, uh, there, there's a couple of reasons why it might be uh, a, a tighter radius. One might be that they might have a better idea where you are, right? Absolutely, yes. They can much better geolocate you. On the desktop, they've improved their geolocation. In fact, a lot, I don't know if many of you might have noticed recently, they now have neighborhood geolocation, auto geolocation in the browser. But even that is very imprecise. And a lot of people, their pop is in a different place than their physical presence. Google hasn't quite resolved that. So it's very imprecise on the desktop. But with mobile, it's very precise. So not only do they know exactly where you are, and they position you in the middle. In other words, the, the proximity calculation that they make in mobile is in physical relation to you, as opposed to some imaginary centroid or imaginary browser location. So it's much more precise. And they assume that you're traveling. And so they'll bring in, they'll reduce the radius if they can, if they have the data. They'll reduce the radius because they assume you want to get to it now. Right. I mean, that's the other part of it. It isn't just that they can locate you better, but the fact that you're mobile means it's it's probably much more immediate. Right. So the distance becomes a bigger factor. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And one of the interesting side effects of that is that there are no tools that we have at, at, available to us that measure this incredible granularity of mobile local search. So tools like MozCast showed a much bigger projected drop than was the reality. And we have no real tools to measure that, you know, that level of detail that Google's actually delivering. So to some extent, we don't know what the changes were in the mobile environment. We know in the desktop because we can see it. But uh, in mobile, we don't really know what the differences are. Right. So let's talk a little bit, though, about some of the things that um, traditionally have uh, uh, been ranking factors for, for local. Let's talk about some of those. So in a broad sense, uh, you know, local is sort of the first entity-based uh, ranking system that Google had long before uh, the knowledge graph. Um, and uh, originally there was a concept that they spoke about in their patents called location prominence, which indicated that um, uh, branded URLs, branded links, straight up links, just mentions of your business name, reviews, uh, were and uh, a similar uh, thing to uh, page prominence where highly noted local sites that referenced you would give you a greater score. So there was always some web element of it, but it was focused around brand and location as opposed to around uh, keywords or concepts. And to some extent, those things still seem to be true, but there's a much bigger element of tradition, whatever uh, current web ranking values are. Starting in 2010, accentuated with Venice in 2012, Google started bringing more web-based signals into the mix. So now, quite frequently, when you see a pack, the first, depending on the competitiveness of the market, the first one, two, or three, or four listings in the back might be driven by organic rank. And then listings two through seven or three through seven might be driven by more traditional local values. One of the things about local search is it's always ambiguous, right? When you say restaurant, do you want the best restaurant, the closest restaurant, the most prominent restaurant? It's an ambiguous search. And Google, in Google Patents, you see this, but they, they uh, one of the elements of the local search that always made it confusing people is they would normalize prominence and distance into a single uh, delivery, uh, you know, of results. So they they give you some that were nearby and some were that prominent and let you so they deliver both results and then they mixed in web results. So it's really a trimodal sort of algorithm. It has been up to very recently. We don't know exactly 
<laughs> what what pigeon is, but so it's sort of web traditional web stuff, traditional local stuff like citations, reviews, uh, brand mentions, branded links, links on your web URL, and uh, that sort of stuff, and location in proximity to the searcher location or to the industry. Right. So uh, since you uh, referenced it, I'm going to draw it out a little bit. Uh, uh, since the queries are kind of inherently or often uh, inherently uh, ambiguous, uh, you get kind of the local equivalent of a query deserves diversity notion. Um, so, uh oh, I'm uh -oh. getting echo now. Echo now. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a, a headset handy, Mike? Uh, maybe that would help. I'll try. I'm going to grab one real quick, too. Um, we're getting some really bad echo. Usually, sorry everybody, usually I don't have this with my uh, microphone. Uh, takes care of this, but I don't know what side. Okay. Can you still hear me okay, Mike? I can hear you just fine. Oh, that's kind of rasty. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for the brief interrupt there, but uh, yeah, so you kind of get the query deserves diversity uh, aspect of... Uh, can you hear uh, me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Uh, so you kind of get a query deserves diversity kind of thing uh, going on. Uh, okay. Actually, I think that, that should fix it. Okay. I didn't have my microphone set uh, properly. So we'll see if that fixes it. Yeah, um, so this whole notion of you show the most prominent, you show uh, the closest, that's kind of like a query deserves diversity thing going on, but it's just tuned to local search. So. Exactly, and there's two levels of prominence. There's lo uh, location prominence, i.e. the prominence of the business, and there's the web prominence, right? So there's even some difference there. And with Venice, you really saw them giving a lot of uh, extra value to the local web you know, sort of local organic uh, pages, where truly local pages were given a boost in the in the in the organic rankings, and that then influenced the local rankings as well. So it was almost three types of things going on in terms of this: Do you want the most prominent web? Do you want the most prominent business? Do you want the closest business? And even closest though is like what point do they measure it from? And that's different as they improve their location measurements in mobile. It's different as they improve their location measurements on the desktop. It was often thought that it was the centroid of the city they're using, but we quite frequently think it might even be in the desktop, the center of that group of businesses, right? So if all of the businesses are clustered in a certain area, that could very well define the centroid for that type of search. So if all the auto dealers are on the edge of town, they're not going to do it from the center of town. They're going to do it from the center of the auto dealers as referenced by your location, right? So, Yeah, interesting. Hey, just a couple of notes from the audience. First of all, uh, Ivana Taylor, who met you at Google Conference in Cleveland, says hi. Um, I just thought I'd let you know that. And then, hi back. <laughs> and Shelly Wingard says, Mike Blumenthal rocks. I learned a lot from him when I worked for Cabela. So. Where does Shelly work these days? God, I've, I saw her. I haven't, I've lost touch with her. Uh, yeah, uh, Colorado SEO pros is what I'm seeing in her hover card. But Shelly, you can let us know in the conference. I mean, in the comments, uh, I'll let Mike know what it says. By the way, everybody, my comment tracker isn't working, um, so I'm pulling this out of the event stream. But we'll still be tracking this. Um, and then uh, we have another question here. Just, uh, but I think you just answered it. Uh, um, uh, just to confirm, they've shifted from using city centers and. What you've really said is it was really more of a tendency to use the center of all the related businesses. Uh, but even so, are they beginning to make more use of actual local position? I think yes. it's certainly true on this kind of device. Um, and I think it's true. I mean, in, in the desktop, it's true as far as they can establish your actual location. Right of the browser. I mean, they're 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 doing a better job of that. It's still a pretty imprecise science, though. So, um, if you let them auto-identify, most browsers uh, auto-identify the location to Google, 
it's on by default and Google guesses a lot of times if you go look like where I live in Ole and they're off by 70 miles as to my actual location because they think it's my pop which is the next big town over as opposed to my actual physical location but they're, that's getting better too if you go into New York City it used to be Manhattan now they're resolving the desktop browser down to your neighborhood they can tell that you're in Chelsea or Tribeca or whatever so they're doing a better job on the browser of locating you they're doing, and they've always done a good job of locating the businesses so it's sort of your proximity to them at some level and in mobile like you said I did a test the other day where I drove to Buffalo 80 miles about every 10 or 15 minutes I do a query for storage or self storage and as I left the rural area my rate I was 10, seven miles from me then they gave me as I moved closer to Buffalo it was five miles and then as I got into Buffalo it was three miles and then as I said near me they reduced it to two miles from me so in other words a diameter of two miles on this radius, very very tight radius so interestingly that's the, the you know it used to be in storage world for example they could be listed out in the uh, industrial section and do fine because somebody could find them out there well if Google's going to be localizing results to a two-mile radius you now in the storage business have to be where people are not where the real estate's the cheapest right so it's going back to the, it's sort of emulating more human traffic behavior and physical movements and that sort of stuff so it's a complex interplay exciting but very uh, disturbing when they make a change like last week and don't really tell us what's happening. Totally. Um, so Jorg Peter Rabanus has a question. What happens if a searcher uses a city name as part of the search query, but they're currently in another city? How does that change all this? Yeah, so Google will calculate the will calculate the centroid based on the center of the industry in that city. So if you're in Ole and you do a search on car dealers in Buffalo, they're going to center the map around the car dealers in the Buffalo market, and that geography will be defined by a combination of the geophrase plus the industry. Yeah, okay. And then one other question on sort of the basics before we dive into it. Just to note on that query, if you do analysis in Google Trends, you can see that those geo queries are dropping way off compared to non-geo uh, explicit queries where most of the queries have switched to assumed geography and so the city you know service plus city queries are dropping way off and part of the problem with our tools is it's much easier to measure the service plus city queries but they're dropping way off and so, uh, the location of the browser becomes an issue but also location of the searcher becomes an issue right well I think people are probably just learning that they don't need to enter all that anymore too right, right. Yeah, well, if you look at the curve of in the trends on the words near me in relation to like restaurants or hotels, starting in 2010, they just started taking off. They're on a hockey stick increase, that that word, as a modifier, and that's a very voice-driven, mobile phone-driven query modifier. You know, restaurants near me, hotels near me, storage units near me, and you look at any of those in trends and they're just on a hockey stick trajectory uh, up. Yeah, very interesting. So uh, one other aspect of uh, uh, local search, um, to me it seemed like, uh, uh, I'll call it data consistency uh, with your Google Places uh, listing and the, uh, um, the way it's shown in Yelp and Yellow Pages and all the various places across the web. Uh, isn't that also a factor in all of this? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge fundamental issue. It's kind of like having title tags on your website that say something other than home, right? Um, yeah, I mean, Google assembles their list totally algorithmically. They buy lists from InfoUSA and, and Axiom. They you know, scrape lists from the super pages. I mean, they look across thousands of websites, including your web page, and they resolve all of those, and they, they are able to resolve some differences, but they cluster the information, and if they can't resolve it, they'll create a second listing, right? If you have enough difference in the name, or if there's multiple phone numbers, or you've moved, you may end up with multiple listings in Google, or you may not get credit for all of the, you know, citation mentions you have. So the bare fundamental in this industry is, you know, consistency of name, address, and phone number, so that the Google machine can properly 
represent you and aggregate the data around you in the cluster. Right, and I've always uh, described it to people as if Google sees uh, any significant level of inconsistency, they lose confidence in your listing. And one thing they don't want to do is give someone an address, have them drive out there and find out there's nothing but woods there or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, their standard is a map-based standard. They, they want people to be able, if you're going to list your business as open from 9 to 5 with a local, and they want the most direct phone number, the most direct address, so that a person who's using maps can be reasonably assured of a positive experience if they drive through it. So that's their, that's their standard, right? So all of their algorithms and all of their behaviors and their rules focus on that standard of, I guess, what Stephen Colbert would call truthiness. Truthiness, okay. Hey, that's our first Stephen Colbert reference on this show. Um, well, it fits um, very well in local. <laughs> totally. Uh, so Hortense Soulier has a question here. With the location targeting being so much more accurate, how would that impact business visibility for service areas rather than a specific location? Well, prior to Pigeon, I would say that Google was using where you put your service area center in the dashboard. Google gave you the opportunity to say that you worked out of this city, even if you're located in the suburbs, and they would use where you put it as the, as the consideration point. However, there's some evidence that in Pigeon, they're using their they're not no longer using that service area information you're giving them, and they're using your information as to where you're really located. A couple that I've looked at, I haven't looked at a lot, so this is very tentative, but there that it some somebody who was right on the edge of town, just outside the search radius, was had moved their pin their service area uh, pin, circle to the center of the city and was you know one in the searches and with pigeon because he was just beyond the radius of the search, dropped out of search altogether, even though he told Google he was servicing the center, it appeared that they were using his actual location to determine whether he was eligible for the search. So again, a very small sample, but it looks like that behavior may have changed with Pigeon. Awesome. So since, since we, uh, I think we've laid a good uh, foundation here, let's get into Pigeon. Um, can you kind of take it from the top with Pigeon and give us uh, sort of your summation of what you think it's about and sure. what we know and what we don't know and all that kind of good well, stuff? Well, what we don't know is probably a lot, fill a lot bigger bucket. But so, I, you know, from my point of view, you have to view it in the big context of Google uh, over the last, you know, two years. One of those that's been very obvious over the last 30 days is the reduction of social and visual distractions, as it were, in the main search results, right? They reduced the author photos starting in December, but dramatically in the last month. Uh, so now only Google Plus shows author photos, right? They reduced video snippets, and so now only YouTube show video snippets. They actually, this hasn't been widely reported, but reduced the display of uh, review snippet stars quite extensively. Now they only show two on a page. They used to show as many as six or eight on a page. and with this uh, update, they've reduced the frequency of the pinned results. Now, they've also, uh, in March, they uh, got rid of the underline in the pin, in the local pack results, so that was a visual distraction. And then, I don't know, nine or eight, ten months ago, they changed the pin color from red to gray. So, and, you know, they've cleaned up all of their design aesthetics. So, from my point of view, this change with a reduction of pack displays on the desktop is consistent with all these other changes that used to sort of direct people away from the top of the page to a lower segment of the page and now they're sort of driving people back to the top of the page. Uh, you know, uh, why that would be, you know, one, you know, you're, you're seeing an era where desktop search has peaked and it's starting to drop. In the last three months have been lower number of desktop searches. So one could postulate strictly, uh, you know, hypothetical, that Google is maximizing desktop income as they're making the transition over to a full mobile environment that we're going to see five years from now, or a mostly mobile environment, right? So, and they're maximizing income by, you know, reducing distractions so people are more likely to click on AdWords, for example. I don't know. 
Um, so you're seeing, I think you got to position the pack reductions in the context of all the other visual reductions. Um, and and then you also need to position in the context of Hummingbird, right, which is uh, orienting search towards this new reality of, of uh, verbal expression of search phrases, like, you know, storage nearby is a very verbal expression of a search. Um, and I think that this reflects that as well. So that's at the highest level. What we know for sure, there's been a reduction of seven packs uh, on the desktop and for standard searches in mobile. We don't know whether there's been a reduction of packs for you know contextual local searches because we have no way to measure that, right? Um, there's been a, an increase in the number of three packs, i.e. Uh, results that show set three pins instead of seven, which again is consistent with that reduction of visual distractions. And there's been a somewhat of an increase in one packs where if you do a search like jewelry appraisal Buffalo, you'll see one business that Google has anointed as the authority business that gets reviews and stars and none other. So those are all uh, things we, we do know. Um, there's also been a reduction of duplicated results. When Google um, split apart the blended results in October, you were seeing a lot of duplicated results. A listing could be at two in organic and then first pack result, for example. You're seeing a lot less of that. Um, obviously, it's changing of the radius. It doesn't hasn't always reduced, but most of the search queries that I looked at, the radius is smaller on the desktop than it was. And there's been a blossoming of what we call pigeon poo, you know, these bad results that Google seems to scrape out of who knows where that are, you know, for example, hotels.com got a listing in the New York hotel search. Well, it's a directory site. It's not a hotel, right? And and there's another reoccurrence of a spammy technique from that was banned in 2011. In local, if you use a highly authoritative directory page, like if you're a lawyer and you use a highly authoritative avo page, it used to bounce you right to the top of local. But well, we're starting to see that again, right? It's really spammy. It's against the rules, but Google's letting them through. Well, you know, again, I think they will be caught and they'll be they'll be squashed. But in the meantime, there's a huge spamming opportunity that mucks up the quality and reduces the opportunity for legitimate businesses to show. So that's what we know. Um, what we don't know is a lot, right? Uh, we don't know what's happening really in mobile. We don't really fully understand. It appears not only have they reduced the radius, which totally shifts which listings show, they seem to have, well, in the, in the searches that are precipitated by a high organic rank, the one or two are still going to be related to the organic strength at site. But below that, there's a lot of confusion in, you know, two through seven. Why are they in the pack? What did they do to get there? Um, some of that we think, you know, Bill Slosky showed me a great patent last week uh, uh, that just came out called Locally Significant Search Queries. And for the first time, Google in this patent is talking about um, user testing results. And if they don't get clicked on, throwing them out of the pack. Well, we've never seen that before in local. That's been common, you know, in organic where if results weren't clicked. So it's the first time we're seeing it. So it could be this is one great big real world test where they're just throwing a bunch of crap in. If people don't click on it, it gets dropped over time as the pack sort of learn what good quality is. And they also said in this patent that there's this testing mechanism. You know, they dropped a lot of packs out of the organic, but they, they said that in this in this patent that queries in maps well, for example, they use the example of the word mimosa, right? Which in organic by itself might be a recipe for a drink, but in local it might be a restaurant. But it would only be a restaurant in certain markets. So they would use signals in that local market given through maps and use it as an indicator to show the pack more in that market for that type of search. So they're testing. I mean, basically what they're describing this patent is a testing cycle of the quality of all local pinned results and and whether they should be showing local pinned results or not. So we could be living through one of these, you know, real-time machine training exercises, which is what it seems like because the pack results were shifting almost every day for the first, you know, week or 10 days of this. And now they're slowly settling down, but we're still seeing day-to-day -day shifts where seven and eight are dropping out of the pack, new ones are coming in. So 
Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm going to go back to where you started. Uh, you talked about the visual distraction aspect, and I get to hold up my phone yet again. Um, you know, where Matt Cox at SMX Advance said that uh, uh, Google expected the search volume um, from mobile devices to exceed that from desktop devices before the end of this year. Um, it's a uh, really interesting uh, this reduction of visual distraction. Also, I bet makes for a better um, um, environment on a mobile device. Uh, and um, each of those, you know, every two files you download in an HTTP exchange is a whole round trip back and forth for the server. So it's a big deal, speed-wise too. So depending, on, at least for at least the image-related stuff. Um, so I've been maintaining that uh, we're entering the era where the mobile device is going to dictate the UI and not the desktop. Exactly. And I think that's what, I think to some extent, that's what we're seeing in Pigeon, is that philosophy expressed, written into the local environment. Yep, totally. So um, also you mentioned, sorry, I'm going to look at my, oh yeah, this whole notion of a training exercise. That's a whole thought thread there too, which is, you know, Google is constantly testing little tweaks here and there in their algorithm. They do changes every single day uh, in at least parameters of some kind, not, not necessarily sweeping changes, but some changes. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to see that they're doing that at such a grand scale right now, because uh, typically it's uh, not that uh, um, you know, that visible to all of us, right, that it's going on. I have to plug my headset back in because something's going on here. So hopefully that will... No, that didn't squash it. So, I'm not hearing it, just in case you're wondering. I mean, you sound great to me. Uh, you don't okay. look so good, but you sound great. Uh, yeah, thank you for the don't look so good part. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the uh, support. And just, just remember what they say. You know, payback is a, you know, I won't finish it's it. It's a bitch, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> okay. So, I don't look so uh, good either, so, you know. There you go. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, it, I think... Um, Boy, we really do have a strong echo now. But sorry, folks, it's got to be coming from uh, from from YouTube here. Um, uh, Mark, can you come back in and tell me how bad it is? Mark Traphagen came in and told me. I want to see if it's manageable for the audience or not. Because um, if not, then we should uh, try an experiment. But okay, uh, with. Uh, I mean, this notion that they're doing the training on such a large scale, uh, you know, or the training of their algorithm on a large scale, really says that they see a certain amount of urgency with this, right? I mean, that's what I'm taking out of that. Because usually the tests are very difficult for people to recognize. Oh, okay, right. Got it. Got well, the other way to look at it is that they could be attempting to bring local into the hummingbird sort of umbrella, right? They have to make that switch at some point, and and they're doing it all or whatever, right? I mean, it could just be that this is a you know uh, what they said was more they were going to be used. They changed. They said it, they were quoted as saying they're going to be refining the distance calculation. I take that to mean smaller and using more traditional web signals in local search. Well, what does that mean? And it could just be that, again, they're trying to bring this into a single uh, algorithm that applies across all entities, not just businesses, right? And they're trying to bring local into the bigger picture of, of a single search algorithm rather than having two. I don't, what do I know? I don't really know. I don't, you know, we, I would love to be a fly on the wall, um, at least, for a couple hours, not very long, I guess. I might get you know swatted by somebody who I insulted, just like you, right, just now. But um, <laughs> so I don't really, you know, one one can only guess about those things, right? We don't know. But I'm trying to come up with logic that that applies, and uh, and the best thing I have is this new patent that Bill showed me, locally significant search queries, and it seems to be that this is a new a new way of approaching local. If that's the case, then one would assume that they need to do it in mass, right? You know, because each of these local results are very 
specific to the local market. They can't do it. They can't test it globally, other than in a broad sense. But if Mimosa only works in New Orleans and it doesn't work as a local search in Los Angeles, then they have to do this testing at very large scale. Well, this ref it's not even testing; it's refinement. They're learning what people are looking for, and they're <laughs> fixing it on the fly. That's yeah. one theory. I mean, I, you know, again, I don't know. I'm just trying to come up with something that explains the massive changes we saw over the last 10 days. Well, I mean, the other thing that's interesting about this is that um, you know, the we've had people for years who've been trying to tell us how bad the signals that they use in regular search are, uh, and um, well. You know, it's like now they're pulling those signals and making them bigger in local search. And uh, that, that kind of gives me uh, some confidence that maybe those signals weren't so bad in the first place. They may be still among the best things we have available to us. Well, those in, our, those in local would argue that the current results are pretty bad. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, one assumes that they will get better, but couldn't get better soon enough from where I sit. A lot of bad results right now. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still hearing an echo. I'm going to try one more experiment with my microphone and see if I suddenly go quiet. Okay. Can you still hear me, Mike? I can, yes. I, I'm still hearing the echo, however. Um, so um, one more thing. Uh, can you check your settings to see if you're, what you have picked for your microphone? How's that? Does that change it? Okay, we'll see. Well, it quieted down. I can still hear it, but it's a little quieter. So, sorry everybody for the technical difficulties. Uh, we're, we're working through it, uh, uh, as you can see. Yeah, it seems pretty dead right now. Cool. Because um, I know the, the, the local algorithms, uh, you know, basing things on reviews, or I mean, having that be a big factor. Well, okay. That's a little scary, right? Uh, pretty spammable kind of signal. Uh, proximity, okay, that's a, a really good signal. Of course, for a long time, that was a really bad data source. Uh, they made a lot of progress on that. Uh, so that's a, a potential. In data accuracy, okay, that's a that's a good uh, uh, signal. Um, um, but, Here's uh, one an interesting patent I read recently was uh, driving directions. Bill wrote about this as well as a signal of prominence. It's kind of hard to fake driving directions. It's hard to, and there was a white paper from Google in 2010 where they correlated frequency of driving directions with review prominence and determined that driving directions were a good signal to ascertain prominence, at least, obviously, of bricks and mortar businesses. It doesn't work for service area businesses. But that that's an interesting signal that's much harder to game um, than, than, say, reviews. Again, I don't, I've never thought that reviews had a huge impact. I think that there's always been a small bump when you hit whatever their gold star standard was was five, then went to ten, now it's back down to five. There was always some bump there, but seeing another bump after that often took infinitely more reviews. So I never saw a huge correlation with lots of reviews in rank. I saw a correlation with some reviews in rank. Yeah, so it brings you to some level of significance, at least when you have some reviews, right? You know, right. any, it's, uh, um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, well, uh, think, about, think about driving directions for a second, though. Right, with driving directions in the patent, they were talking about the ability to ascertain which businesses were popular from, say, 6 a.m. in the morning to 9 a.m., right? Because that's when people would ask for the driving directions. In other words, with driving directions, they can categorize them by time of day, distance people are willing to drive, so they can personalize your results based on how far historically you wanted to drive, right? as well as a business that's really popular might attract people from further away, so they might show it in a bigger radius. I mean, uh, driving directions is an incredibly powerful one that there's a patent on. Again, whether they're using it or not, it's very difficult to ascertain. Right, right. And so just so uh, people are clear, you're referring to somebody going into Google Maps and, uh, and requesting directions to a location. Um, right. And the interesting thing about that is that it kind of gives you a, uh, 
a service area for a, a business for the physical location, right? I mean, right. if you're willing to drive 40 miles to get to something, then that, you know that's a, uh, that's a signal at a few different levels, right? Especially if it's happening exactly. a lot. So, right. right. But what yes. we don't know, to your point, is whether or not we're getting a statistically significant amount of information that that's actually a valid, valuable signal in practice. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. It's like so many things in the world of search, right? We 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 conceive is uh, it's a possible signal, therefore we assume they're using it. <laughs> that's the that's what happens with a lot of people, you know. And uh, um, so, um, so what, one thing you didn't talk about, but you alluded to, and it'd be worth just uh, bringing this out, uh, is let's talk about what we don't know about pigeon, and uh, let's be explicit about that. Okay. So the big thing we that is the most confusing right now is primary ranking attributes when they're not using the web prominence as the signal. It, it, the pack has been disrupted, you know, from two through seven. It's very confusing right now. There's no clear correlations that we're able to find on those lower pack results. Uh, the top pack results in many searches appear to be a function of web prominence, but the lower ones, it's not clear. And so uh, until it stabilizes, we may not be able to tell, and even then we might not. Um, so we don't know that if it's changed. In other words, if these traditional location prominence signals are less. Um, we don't know in mobile where there's a growing body of searches. Search is exactly the way it is. In the said in 27, it's going to drop in desktop results that show the pack. Yeah, well, but we don't really know what happened in mobile. You know, in the real mobile searches, in other words, only in simulated mobile searches where we simulate location or add a geophrase do we know. But most people, I think, are not doing that anymore. So that whole range, we don't know what happened to those results. Um, we don't know exactly how, we've never known exactly how they calculate this diameter. And um, we still don't know, and it's more critical now because it seems to have been reduced. And are there things that businesses do in, could do in the area that would increase it? You know, historically, you could move a service area business literally into this radius, or you could, for example, knock some egregious spammers out and they would possibly expand the radius. We don't know if those things are still valid. Um, so how much more, you know, then we don't know what we don't know, <laughs> which is probably a whole lot more than we even think we know. Totally. So, um, uh, so we, we don't really know what the uh, how the ranking factors have been altered, basically, in summary. But and it may be one of those things that until people conduct uh, hundreds or thousands of tests, we won't really fully figure out. Exactly. Yep. Right. That being said, you know, I think that the same, you know, the stuff we've been doing and telling people to do, which is good content, eat a good semantically well done website, accurate nap, a consistent review presence. Those are all things that are going to be of value to you regardless, right? And we assume that quality in all of those things is important and will continue to be. I mean, one thing about Google is, and this is, you know, they're trying to emulate the way a human evaluates these things. And I think their, their algorithms are getting more complicated, more sophisticated. And I think, you know, I noticed the other day uh, with the this Union House Hotel in uh, Hudson, New York, right? They got in this, into a uh, storm, a social storm, because they had a contract that uh, said they were going to find wedding parties if they left a bad review on Yelp. Well, it blew up on them, went all over the internet. But you could see this huge sort of both mentions in Google and link backs and stuff. I mean, obviously, there's a negative example of being all of a sudden being visible. But I really think the things that make you visible in an organic marketing way, newspaper articles, mentions, those sorts of things, I think are always going to be the things that Google is going to be looking for, 
right? If you get if you get uh, mentioned in Wire magazine or the New York Times, and you get it, you know that's going to be that's going to count for a lot, and Google's going to count it for a lot because those are heavily curated resources, and Google's going to value those. So I think all the stuff we that traditional marketers did, sort of translated online, are always going to be good and local, and I think more so now, right? And while we're waiting for things to settle down, you know, quit worrying about gaming it. Start worrying about marketing your business and, you know, making yourself more visible, right? That's Google Nirvana, right? Having everybody worrying about marketing their business. Uh, that's kind of what they want you to do in the first place. Exactly. That's right. So review counts are much, you know, to me are much like link building, right? If you sort of focus on reviews as opposed to business quality, I think that's the wrong focus. If you provide excellent customer service, you're going to get your, sh and you ask for feedback, you're going to get your share of reviews. And if you don't, you're going to get, you know, you're in trouble. You're not going to be able to game that. Or you, you might be able to game it, but I don't think in the end it serves anybody. It's like link building, like you pointed out. It's a short-term way to approach what really is a long-term quality issue about a business. Right. So uh, Vipin Kumar is asking, uh, uh, isn't it a part of Google semantic search? Um, I'm not sure if he's referring specifically to pigeon or local search for generally, but I mean, I guess uh, arguably uh, uh, the notion of mapping local intent and things like that is, an ele you know, has a semantic element to it. Um, so to some degree, I think it's sort of the one of the earliest ways where they tried to uh, capture, um, you know, semantic relevance even before some of the things that have happened on the desktop. Yeah, I think you're right in that regard. I mean, I think they're bringing this all together now, right? I think they're, with Hummingbird, they've developed an environment in which they can evaluate both web pages and real-world entities and rank them. And the ways they do that, I mean, one of them is, is semantic relevancy and relationships. But again, I don't know that it's easily manipulatable or, sh or even sh maybe it is, but I don't think it is. It's getting harder too. Absolutely. And related to that is the notion of um, do you think it matters these days at, uh, in the same way that it's beginning to matter clearly more and more on the desktop to have um, a, a page which is uh, I, I'm going to say I'm going to put in quotes here complete, by which I mean you know you arrive at someone's uh, uh, you know local phone store page, um, and one would conjecture and I'm going to make these numbers up that you know 30% of the people are looking to buy phones, 25% uh, are looking for accessories, you know 25% are looking for you know something else, and someone driving direction, someone a phone number, etc that, um, you know, that you have a page that looks like it's constructed uh, and designed to serve essentially the majority or the great majority of the user needs of people coming to the page. There's a lot of evidence that that's a, an issue in normal web search. Um, do you think that kind of analysis is factoring in into local search at all? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I... I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think if, if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, Google's moving local search algorithm into their main algorithm. And so the answer would be yes, if that's what's happening in the main algorithm. Right. Okay. And uh, what about schema? That's what Bob Strassel Jr. wants to know if schema is playing a bigger and bigger role now. Well, schema, you know, has never been a ranking signal per se. It's a clarity signal, right? It's a way to be sure that the machine understands what it is you're trying to tell it in a semantically clear way, right? And so if you're a location, you should mark it up in schema. And if you're particularly if you're a multi-location business where Google's machine could confuse two addresses and not know which one's really you, it becomes critical. Certainly, you know, author has some value, review markup has some value. You know, I think you want to respect Google's guidelines in these matters of original content. Uh, know that you mark up and I think that it makes sense to do again I don't think it's a ranking factor it's just making sure that the machine which is sort of like a three-year-old with bottle bottom glasses 
can see you clearly, right? And I think that's what schema does, and it does it very well. So if my answer is yes, by all means, do it. Yep. And we have a clarification question from Jorg Peter Rabanis again. Uh, he unclear on what web prominence is. Well, well, I mean, I was just coming up with something for PageRank or whatever Google is referring to as the organic algorithm, right? Some mythical number that represents why Google shows one page higher than another page, uh, uh, whatever that is. So I was using it as a theoretical construct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is just a general way of, uh, we could call it uh, assessing the overall authority on the topic matter. Exactly. Right. Uh, and another question from Bob Strassel, this time about geotags, if that will help your local presence more uh, in addition to uh, uh, semantic markup. You know, I th Google uses multiple techniques to understand where something is. I don't think one helps more than the other. I don't think um, RDF, or whatever it is, the older semantic markup is any worse than the newer schema. Google is flexible. They will understand it whether you use it or not. Again, I think it's a clarity signal, not a ranking signal. You know, it doesn't indicate your relative prominence. It re indicates to Google who you are, where you are, what you do. Um, and a little bit about you, reviews, or your authorship, or your publisher, right? And those are all valuable things to tell Google and to tell Bing as well. But um, I don't think that they're ranking factors. I wouldn't sweat the bullets other than to be sure that Google knows who you are. And that goes back to nap consistency, right? If you've got a screwed up nap where locally says one thing and InfoUSA has another and a third at Superpages and you've used call tracking numbers and they're all over the internet, it doesn't matter whether you use geocoding or semantic, you're going to have trouble with Google because they're not going to be able to assemble your data <laughs> accurately. Right. And how does Google My Business uh, tie into all of this? Well, Google, My Business is Google's uh, sort of the merger of places and plus. In some ways, it's interesting. You know, basically, it has attempted to reduce the places and plus interface, to create a simpler interface that gives a small business a platform in which to experience Google's products, right? So from my business, they can have a little bit of, they can add a lot of data, they can add a little bit of data to Google's local canonical index, right? Um, they also can post to Plus from there. They can see their local anal insights, local analytics. They can respond to reviews from there. They can see all the reviews from around the web. They have a quick link over to their analytics from there. So it's basically Google's portal for a small business uh, that is, based, you know, is attempting to integrate Google's myriad products into a simpler, friendlier environment. It's mostly a UI upgrade, uh, really, more than anything. Um, and it's a relief after years of having multiple interfaces. I mean, for one period in time, there was Google Places, there was MapMaker, there was Google uh, Dashboard for Places, and there was uh, Google Plus, right? There were four interfaces that a small business could use to affect their basic geodata, and now there's one. So in that sense, it's vastly superior. I think you need to realize, though, that Google doesn't use anything you give them there for ranking data. It's just a way for them to confirm and establish connection with you. Uh, you know, they want to contact with a small business, and that's where they're doing it. it, it in fact, it's one of the things I don't like about the product. They imply that if you go there and you do that stuff, you're going to rank higher. Well, you're not. It's mostly off. All you can do there is eye candy. Um, you know, and you're going to rank higher if you do a good job with your website, you do a good job of getting noticed in your market, you do a good job with NAP, but you're not going to rank higher just by going to my business and, uh, you know, filling out the basic data. Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, cool. I mean, I think we're, we're uh, getting towards the end here. Do you have any last uh, areas that you'd like to chat about, uh, Mike, before we uh, call us a wrap? And I also like to give my guests... Uh, uh, an opportunity to, you know, sort of just give some closing advice uh, if they would like to uh, to the audience. Well, the only closing advice is a bit of a pitch. Uh, Local U, which is David Mim, Mike Ramsey, 
married bowling. Oftentimes Google comes and myself. We're doing an event in New York City. Uh, you're probably there too at SMX, and it's a local you sort. Of, it's a local sort of immersion day. It's sort of processes and procedures for local, and it's a day of it. And so if you really want to immerse yourself and you're not that familiar with local, it's an opportunity to get hands-on, interact with Google, interact with David and Mary and uh, and uh, Mike Ramsey. And it's just a great day for really learning every, you know, a lot in one day. So that's my closing is, you know, take some training. You do great training too. Uh, but I want them for New York City. I want the customers. So you're going to have to take it. <laughs> Back position. So you know, I mean, it's it's a big topic. It's unique. It's always existed separately, and but I think going forward, I mean, for me, like in 2005, it's like I was curious why nobody was writing about it. 2006, 2007. You know, I think the the internet has inverted. It used to be a you know individuals sitting at their desktop looking at worldwide stuff, and now it's people around the world looking at local stuff. And to me, it's like with mobile phones and Bluetooth and uh, you know, iBeacon. We're just at the beginning of the of the of the internet of of local, and it's like, wow, you know, we're in for a ride. Uh, so hang on to your seats. I'm doing it. I'm hanging on for dear life. So, uh, no, that's great. Yeah, no, from my perspective, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot that goes in there. It's going to remain a dynamic and changing environment. Uh, uh, local search, that is. I mean, we all have Google web search, but talking local today, uh, you know, pigeon is interesting because what it did is it introduced uh, a fresh round of uncertainty into how things were ranking, uh, made some of the classic uh, uh, web ranking signals bigger factors in local search. I think you look, yeah, go ahead. The problem is we don't know which fact, which traditional web factors those are. That's the problem, right? Is yeah. it all of them? Is it some of them? We don't really know. Yeah. Why did Why does Google pick a page and say that this page should show high in this locale but not in that locale? You know, there's questions that we don't know the answers to yet that are important to really understand what's going on. Yeah, totally. And uh, uh, so, you know, the, the the message here is you're you're dealing in a very uncertain environment, and it really is good to study, as uh, Mike has suggested, and and learn as much as you can about how it works. But it's also really good just to work on you know, business fundamentals, which is also something that uh, Mike was uh, saying earlier in the show. You really have to uh, take care of the basics. Uh, um, by the way, Bill Slosky added a, a note here uh, about your NAP information. This is uh, we did talk about this earlier in the show, but it's worth uh, 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 reinforcing is that you know you really do want to make sure your name, address, and phone number information. Is consistent across the web. It's the logical equivalent to title tags in local search. Uh, Google's, uh, sorry, Bill's phraseology is particularly interesting. He refers to each, uh, I'll call it, set of uh, uh, NAP data that's consistent as uh, as a cluster, and notes that smaller clusters are weaker. So if you have your name, address, phone number data consistent all across the web. That makes a larger cluster and hence a stronger uh, uh, entity, essentially, for Google to, um, to, to look at for you. Um, but uh, um, you know, expect a lot more change, because Google is obviously testing with Pigeon. Uh, they're going to settle on something somewhere along the way. So uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Mike. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, sure, especially on short notice. So I really appreciate that. That's it for the Digital Marketing Excellence Show today, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, hope to see you uh, next time.